when I came up with the title, Songs in the Key of Life, to me, that was a challenge to actually um, do an album relating to life or saying uh, songs in the key of life. It's impossible to cover all of what life is about. As much as Motown wanted to be finished and to be, to be done, to be released, um, I mean, I wanted to finish it as well, but I didn't want to finish it as much as I wanted for it to be a representation of how and what I was feeling at that time. He uh, took his life experiences and he put them all into the Songs of Key of Life and, um, and it worked, you know, it worked. I felt so proud to be on such a landmark record. I mean, there was nothing like that before, nothing. Stevie Wonder did it, number one, uh, and he was involved in every aspect of uh, creating it, uh, from the producing to writing and, and performing and playing. And also, he, he deals with it like extended form, you know, it has a unified theme. It's subliminal, but it's somehow it's a unified theme. Would you like to go with me down my dead end street? We recorded songs in the key of life in two studios, the Hit Factory in New York and Crystal Sound here in Los Angeles. Over the two and a half years it took to make the album, we used different musicians and guest singers. Throughout the period, however, there was a core group of musicians that played on most of the songs. Nathan Watts, the bass player, is still with me, but I've not seen the other musicians for a long, long time, over 20 years. We've come together again today for this film, to re-record some old songs, and to recall some good times with old friends. Check it out. All I like. I missed my, my, my high school reunion, you know, so. This is just as good. This is it. <laughs> don't worry about it. You have more fun. In fact, I, in fact I, never, I don't think I graduated high school because. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, oh, yeah. that's right. You know why? Because that's when we went on the road. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. That's right. I was like 17 when, when I got with Steve, so it's like, I, didn't, I don't think I actually graduated. I left, before, I left before I got my diploma, so I don't even know if I made it. Wait a minute. Oh my God, what a realization. That's right, I'm in trouble. I'll never be able to get a job without a high school diploma. I challenged myself to at least writing as many different things about many, as many different things as I could to cover as many topics as I could in dealing with the title and representing what it was about. So in one sense, I had already had lots of songs I'd already done, some that have still yet to be released. Hee hee hee. And um, the title would give me a challenge, but equally as important as a challenge, it would give me 
an opportunity to express uh, my feelings as a, as a songwriter, as an artist, and as well to, to be joined by the people that were a part of, of working with me on this. I had met John some years ago when I first came out to California and did some of my first recordings at the studio that he uh, co-owned with his partner at that time, Andrew, which was Crystal. When I met Gary at Record Plant LA, when I was working on a lot of the stuff uh, that would ultimately become Innovisions, I put the two of them together and said, let's try working together and see how you all work with each other and how the three of us work together and the kind of hours that I kept. Gary would work one day, John would work another day, and then sometimes it would be the two of them, and they would alternate. Ultimately, uh, it was them working with me through the, at least the two and a half, three years, and finishing up Songs of the Kid Life. Well, Songs in the Key Life, it, as Steve mentioned earlier, it's, um, it was something that we were definitely too wrapped up in at the time to really be ob objective about it. Looking back on it now, um, I really have to thank Steve for giving me the opportunity to to uh, sort of make whatever musical history that we didn't think was history at the time, but it obviously um, uh, is a classic to some people. It has vision. It has certainly elements that relate to the time period in which it was created, but the lyrical approach, the musical approach, go beyond the time to the extent that you, you, it's no surprise to us that uh, 2000 is a few years away. People will still be able to listen to Sgt. Pepper. They'll still be able to listen to songs in the key of life. Stevie Wonder, especially with that record, you know, made a uh, mark in music, and that is that popular music can be art too. <laughs> One thing that really made it work great was actually something we just kind of did by chance, and that is I took um, the um, reel-to-reel uh, Stellavox home with me, a uh, portable, portable recording machine, and I told Yolanda, I said, look, um, I want us to get some sounds of, of you know, just Aisha, and that's just the interaction between um, yourself, uh, me, and, and her. All of us just, you know, obviously Aisha had no sense of what was going on. She just knew that one of the mixed sounds. And that particular sound there is not Aisha, but it's a, a baby that um, the doctors, uh, a doctor that we knew, a doctor friend found, and we were able to, to uh, get the birth of this, uh, this child. And that is Yolanda there, laughing, Miss Aisha. Uh, this is when we were at the Regency uh, apartment hotel, and she's messing with the dresser drawer, and uh, just being silly, just being a baby, baby girl. The one thing that I usually focus on every time I hear it, though, is her. I'm sorry, but it is. You know, it's just funny to hear them talking oh, about Oh, hear me, me talking. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when she starts laughing, she's like, ah, oh, it sounds like she said, beat me. <laughs> That's I my hate favorite. that part. That's my favorite. Beat me. Beat you. <laughs> she says, beat me. You understand why she's saying, why she's saying, yeah, beat me. Said, we never beat our child, we never did. I promise you. <laughs>
I mean, I knew it was good, but I couldn't believe the success of it. I mean, it was just big, huge. Um, that was a mistake there by the harmonic. I never corrected that. <laughs> <laughs> Want to run it back a little bit? Can you run it back? Huh? Yeah, run it back a little bit. Punch. Yeah. Punch it out. <laughs> Let's erase that so they don't let me hear that again. It's like taking S's off, huh, Steve? <laughs> Take the harmonic out just by itself. <laughs> That's funny, I never heard that. I'll admit I to that mistake. That Punch! <laughs> 72 was talking book, 73 was uh, Inner Visions, and 74 was fulfilling this first finale. And so we were, we were had geared up for this album, and instead of it coming that in the same year or the next year, we had a whole other year. <laughs> and. And it's one thing about any record label that when you do your budgets and you do all of your cash flow projections and all that, and you have an album coming off of three big albums like that, then you, you are in a lot of trouble when, uh, when it's a, a year late. There's songs to make you smile, there's songs to make you sad, but with a happy song to sing, it never seems as bad. To me came this melody, so I've tried to put in words how I feel Tomorrow will be for you and me did songs in the key of life unfortunately for me unfortunately um, his contract was up well Barry and I have always had a a, a very a very straight to the point relationship um, uh, since I was very little I would give my opinion about something and it wasn't always what he wanted to hear and vice versa. I mean, there were things that he would say to me that I wouldn't always want to hear, but uh, he was very honest and very candid about what he felt, and as too I was. He made me pay $13 million, and in those days, $13 million was a lot of money. A lot of money. But it, was, it took the people with the vision, like Stevie, uh, to know to figure out what's the equitable situation because to me a good a good businessman is one that understands the dynamics of win-win that's what it's all about and i'd heard that was the unprecedented deal and it was the most that's ever been paid and and um and it was in 1976 and i i was like but i had to do it because there was no way that i was going to lose stevie i didn't pay attention to, to to that part of the business until i got stranded in europe in 1959 and 60 and almost committed suicide it was the worst it was a great time but it was a rough time uh, i didn't pay any attention to that before and i went back and i had to pay off debts for seven years and on i think it probably cemented the concept of the superstar artist who had to be taken seriously and I think Stevie, from some experience, figured he had, out he had to do it too. And I saw main, its primary example was Picasso. Unbelievable. And it boils down to being in control of your own destiny. Because it's a terrible feeling to think that you get to be 70 years old, you know, and you still have to go out and talk to some 24-year-old executive, you know, to get a gig, man. You know, that's not happening. <laughs> I didn't really think about how much it was going to cost or you know, if they had to bring the price down to make it uh, compatible, uh, compatible for you know, compatible for for what was happening in the music industry, I didn't really think about any of that stuff. I was shaking in my boots. <laughs> Very fortunately, he was brave enough, brave enough to uh, to take the chance, to take that challenge, to say, you know what, um, I believe in him enough to do this, and um, I believe in the gamble. And you know what? He was a smart man. I mean, it was like such a masterpiece because you go from, 
village ghetto land to a certain duke and to I wish, which is incredible. When I heard I wish, you know, I thought like so many other people in the world when they heard the record, I wish I could be back in those days again, you know, because all the stuff that, that he talked about there. And, uh, and not only did he express it, he did it in a rhythm that was so unique. I went on that. Bang! <laughs> by the box. This is tight. It sounds really great. Thanks, John. picked everybody. You know, say, when, from the beginning, all these cats, Steve individually chose everybody here. That's yeah, stuff you told us all these other years, man. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say one thing. I want to mention one person that's not here with us. The only one that's not. That's Ray Mala. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. He was great. Oh, no, 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 I don't think any recording took place in the daytime. I, in, oh! 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 We stayed up all night. Yeah. <laughs> I wish began uh, the evening after a Motown picnic. I went to Cristo and we started on this piano and we started the first track with the keyboards. After we did the keyboards, um, I then put um, a drum track down. It's Magic uh, was a song that I wanted to, to say, as I did in the, in the lyric, uh, to say all of the things that, um, that you know, uh, the song represents that is really talking about love. I mean, obviously, it is love. If, if love is magic, then why can't it be everlasting? But I didn't want to say love. Like on seashores, there are shells. Like the time that always tells. It holds the key to every heart throughout the universe. It fills you. And with it, why aren't we as careful? The harp player on uh, If It's Magic was uh, um, Dorothy Ashby. She was a great harpist. I mean, uh, she had 
done a lot of stuff, a lot of jazz stuff around Detroit, but um, unfortunately never received the kind of recognition that she deserved. And I just was so very happy that we were able to find her and uh, her grace was with, uh, with accompanying me with us with such a, a great ability as she did have in doing, if it's magic. As much as I did it on various times, I did versions of it with the piano, um, the magic happened with her playing the harp and me singing on top of that. Why can't we make it everlasting Like the lifetime of the sun Originally, Sir Duke was done on the 16 track. I think so. Yeah. Crystal. And right. then you all got a new 24 track. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and we transferred it over. The studio, exactly. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Because I remember trying to, you know, like, Listen, see what that sounds the same. Does it sound the same, Stevie? <laughs> For that kind is of Is that money, the 24-track or is that the 16-track? <laughs> I think that's the 4-track. <laughs> yeah. Who was no. he impersonating then, you think? <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was like the man on the, on the tape. Like, oh, yeah. The other guy. 500 hertz. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. And Steve Medeo did it. <laughs> well, One day we were in this studio right here, and I think, um, I don't know what album it was. Yeah, Stevie okay. was with the alligator. <laughs> <laughs> Stevie, was, Stevie was being led in this one room right here where we're sitting right now, and Steve was walking, taking his record. Someone was leading them in, I don't know who it was, but Steve Medeo said something, and I just laugh at it about this very day. Steve was about to take a step. Steve, don't step on my pet alligator. <laughs> Stevie stopped right here. <laughs> You know, he's blind, and you, and you sit there and you wonder, this, this, this man can't even see, but he sees so many more things that people with sight don't see. He sees, it's like he sees things of the soul more than things of the, the, the uh, world of our quote-unquote reality, you know. So much of what Stevie has um, is what is not through outside training, but through his own studies, you know, through his own um, development. He's a profoundly creative person and a profound human being, too. And you match those two things together. A giving person, he's such a giving person, and that's, that's all part of that whole thing. I don't know, I don't know how to explain it or analyze it, but I, I felt it for a long time, and the whole world's felt it. And then he's just studied a lot of things himself and, and learned a lot. And uh, also stumbled on a lot of things, uh, perhaps out of ignorance, because he maybe wasn't so jaded by uh, the rules that a, a teacher might tell us. That's the, the one drawback with education is that te they teach you rules, but they don't teach you that the rules are just guidelines and they can be broken. But I never crossed a man that didn't deserve it. Me be treated like a punk, you know that's unheard of. You better watch how you're talking and where you're walking, or you and your homies might be lying and chalk. I really hate the trip, but I got a low. As they croak, I see myself in the pistol smoke. Fool, I'm the kind of cheater little homies want to be like on my knees in the night, saying prayers in the street lie. And I said, what is that? I said, what's that? He said, oh, that's just something I'm working on. I said, I, I said what is it, though? He said, oh, it's, it's a Stevie song. I said, I never heard that before. I never heard this song before. What is, I said, whose is it? I said, whose track is this? He said, I'm just working something I'm working on. He said, LV, LV had just walked in maybe an hour before I did. And I said, it's mine. I said, how much you want for it? It's mine, I want it. That song really, um, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with it. Um, I wanted to have that kind of string feel of, um, say, an Eleanor, Eleanor Rigby, the Beatles song. But I wanted to take it to, um, to dealing with a lyric that would make without question, uh, you understand exactly what, what we're talking about. This version of it starts with a, a gong that comes in and it's backwards. That was difficult to do, that entailed turning the tape upside down, figuring out where you go in, where you're going to come out, and it, it takes time to do it, uh, but it was very effective and is a result of the gong at the end of the tune. That's what gave Steve the idea that we should go put one backwards at the front. Uh, the other element that's very important to the song uh, is a Yamaha Dream Machine, a large synthesizer that was polyphonic. It allowed Steve to play many notes at a time instead of the traditional way, which was to layer one note at a time, a very tedious, long process. Uh, now he could play big arrangements, and uh, it changed the way we could work, and we used it 
uh, a lot on this album. It, it was very important to the album. So many people live um, in a past, whether it be in a time where they've, you know, where for them segregation was a good thing, a great thing to do, and um, racism and just whatever the evils of the world uh, were. Uh, they wanted to kind of live and celebrate those things. And then there's the other group that, you know, spending most, you know, their lives living in a future paradise, living in a time or living in the spirit of the day when people will be one, when all of what has been prophesied becomes the reality. And so they were looking forward to that. The other elements in this song that are important are the percussion, and the percussion is really anchored by these Hare Krishna bells. Steve had the idea for the song that it would have a universal theme if he put in uh, Hare Krishna bells, and he arranged to have a group of Hare Krishna devotees come and play. And uh, they're used throughout playing these bells. Um, and then later on, they'll come in and they'll start to chant. Along with that percussion, we have uh, cowbells, we have kungas that go along with that. Uh, we have um, hand claps, but I think they're really stick claps. Rhythmically, I wanted to give it a kind of Latin feel, as it had with a little twist of the backbeat thing, you know, kind of influenced by that whole Earth, Wind & Fire groove that was happening back then. Um, I had done a few, well, one of the recording of Pastime Paradise where I tried putting drums on it, which at that time, I guess you would say, like having an orchestra like with a Barry White kind of feel where they're like. Along with that, then we layered vocals, which is his lead vocal, and two other vocals that will double him in various parts of the song, and then a third very high vocal that gives an eerie quality to certain parts of the song. Here we have the Hare Krishnas coming in. And then it's going to be followed by the large choir, very large gospel choir. So you get the quality of the Hare Krishna chant against We Shall Overcome, which makes it a very haunting song. Well, I'm very glad that ultimately I did not um, keep the drums on the, on the song, because it worked really good with the Latin feel and with the bass and the whole thing. Just various counter rhythms. It's Steve's view of the whole album, which is, you know, people should be together and take care of each other. And so in the end is the gong is what gave him the idea to do the reverse gong at the front. So that's what Gangsta's Paradise is. It's not a rap song. Uh, people call it, a, call it a gothic rap song. They tried to come up with all these names for it. But what it really is, is a new Negro spiritual. Why are we so blind to see that the ones we hurt are you? Now see, wonder time is different than the standard mean time, <laughs> right? Like, you know, there's the equator, and then, you know, after you get, you know, so they figured, it's, actually, they're going to put it in the geographic books, because, see, Steve will go for, you know, three, four days and then take a nap, you know, and he basically, when you're in a studio, too, you're in an environment, you're creative, so time evolves, like, differently, right? So we all have this, we're all going to, we're all going to sue Steve, because we all have this dysfunction where we can't sleep anymore. <laughs> Because our bodies don't know, how to, you know. Like I, I, I went to the Betty Ford Center. And, and, 
I went, to, I went to the Chick Center for, you know, and I said, look, I got this problem. I seem to want to stay up and record music all night long. Can you help me? You know, and I sleep every two or three days, and, you know, essentially, what he did is he, t you know, he turned us all into va vampires, essentially. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm the only guy that goes to Japan and actually is on the right schedule. <laughs> Saturn. Saturn. As we say on our planet, right? Saturn. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, it was good to see you. Good see you. Good. Um, just thinking about that whole thing with Saturn, um, obviously I was, I, I wondered what, what inspired you to take what I had as the original concept of going back to Saginaw to write going back to Saturn what what happened with that how did you do that mm -hmm. you know it's like the way it's so amazing uh, Steve the way that you write it's like the song is like already written in there so when I heard you just have to chip away at the uh, at the at the rock and find the because your syllables are like you, you kind of channel this other language it sort of turns in English and I just sort of moved some of the syllables around and the song was like basically written by the time you uh, gave me the tape because uh, you were saying Saginaw and it's the funny thing how when you're sort of driving around a car or something or you're not paying attention and you listen to something on tape, you know, you remember back in the days when we would try to get stuff off of records and we'd write all the wrong lyrics down, mm -hmm. you know, and we find out years later it's something else. Well, I thought you were saying Saturn. Really? Yeah, it sounded like Saturn for a minute and Saturn, it basically just represents a Shangri-La or a, a perfect kind of place where people are re realizing their true potential as, as, as uh, spiritual beings. I mean, because we are basically spiritual beings having a human experience. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Saturn, speaking of, you know, all the kinds of, what? I was like looking at your hair here. Yeah, well, you know, you kind of got me into this band. Remember, I was probably the first Italian to have hair braided back in the 70s, see, because, you know, I remember I had, I tried to do cornrows like you, mm -hmm. and my head bled. My <laughs> head swelled up like a big watermelon, and it bled, so I said, I have to find my own religion. So I basically started the Pastafarians, which is the Italian Rastafarians, because they wouldn't have me in the regular Pastafarians, being that I ain't from Jamaica. So you see what I did is I started, inside of each one of these here spindle lock things here is pasta, see? Oh, and we wrap wow. the pasta up here, see? And then over here is our prayer beads. See, we pray over here on these things here and see. How pasta. do you communicate with the people from Saturn? No, from this? Saturn, this one over here is Saturn here. Take this one here and you just want to say a few words to the people from Saturn there? Hey! They did. You How must, you doing? Don't forget, talk in our original tongue. I'm always intrigued by his orchestral use of, of synthesizers. It's always interesting. Um, and he, 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 he doesn't fall into the a certain trap that I've often fallen into. I, I uh, very often try to duplicate acoustic sounds on a synthesizer. I try to make the strings sound like real strings. I try to make the breaths sound like real breaths. And uh, uh, Stevie lets the synthesizers uh, be what they are, something that's not acoustic. Now we had, um, between John um, and Gary and myself, we come up with a simulated string sound to give us the feeling of a, you know, a, you know, an orchestra doing a kind of a. And we played this classical arrangement through the phone, which had just him humming some of the lyrical dimensions to it. And I said, what is that? He said, it's called Village Ghetto Land. And I asked him to explain the concept that he had in mind. And he began to talk about this whole idea of people who were at the bottom and the sort of uh, dichotomy of people at the top in another world while reality was occurring all around them. Would you like to go with me? On my dead end street Would you like to come with me To the village ghetto land The 
night I finished the last draft, I went to work on the all-night show. At 5.20, he called me in the studio and said, I'm ready for the song. We had not talked in that three-month period. So I said, I don't, have it, I don't have it with me, but it's at home. When I get home, I'll call you in the studio. It was in Los Angeles. I called him. I read him the lyrics. He said, man, that's fantastic. That's exactly what I wanted. That's it. Give it to my secretary. So I gave her the lyrics. Now I'm really excited now. I hang up the phone and I'm saying, yes. The phone rings 15 minutes later and he says, oh, oh I forgot to tell you. I added another verse to the arrangement. So write the other verse and call me back in 10 minutes. I'm recording it now. now <laughs> and I mean, it took me three months <laughs> to get the drafts right. He wants this, this verse in 10 minutes. I said, okay. So I got up and I, I, wrote, I wrote something, you know, thinking that maybe this is in the flavor of what we're talking about. And he, he called back. He called back in 10 minutes. He said, you got it? I said, yeah, I read it. He says, that's it. And pow, there it was. There was a great lyric written by um, Gary Bird because I, I knew what I wanted the song to say to kind of not only make mockery of, of a condition of a situation unfortunately that still exists in certain parts of, of, of the world and but pretty much so throughout the world so as much as the world has gotten smaller because of mass communication we still have people starving uh, living in very very bad conditions uh, we still have people who do have enough to give not giving anything at all. I wonder what would happen to them. But anyway, um, Gary had written a great lyric for the song, Gary Bird, and um, it really worked for that emotion, that feeling that I wanted to get across. Family's buying dog food now. That was a very distressing line to a lot of people, families eating dog food. But that's a reality. I think it's a reality today in ghettos. Um, some things haven't changed in 20 years. Uh, but again, I, I think just the dryness and the intimacy of the piece lends itself to what Steve is trying to say. For what we have. Tell me, would you be happy? Will it get to Families buying dog food now, starvation roams the street, babies die before they're born, infected by the grief. Some people say that we should be glad for what we have. Tell me, would you be happy in 1996, 7, 8, 9, 2000? I like great songs. I like stuff that, that is different and unique, and, but also saying something that the, that the public can relate to on whatever level. And Stevie had a little subculture going with all of his stuff, as well as the obvious, which makes a great writer, great producer, great artist. Everything has that special Stevie Wonder touch to it, you know, that special um, beauty, special, um, uh, uh, interest, uh, interesting, um, harmonic uh, relationship, or, uh, or a special, funky kind of, of uh, rhythmic uh, component, and uh, this is one of the great geniuses of our time. And he excelled in every field. It wasn't just his writing that was creative and, 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 and mixed, but it was his producing that was unique and his sound that was unique, his chord structure that people are still trying to figure out today, <laughs> you know. We beat this thing. We kicked it down on the ground. Come on, work thing, so I said. It refused. It's quiet right now, actually. But once it gets the tape, you turn it off, you work it again, you know what's gonna happen. So, this time I went to the 90s on this particular sound. This is a simulation of, of um, you know, the sound that we're gonna, we're gonna use from the ARP synthesizer. So, you got to work with what you got to work with. 
So we'll work with this. Okay? Cool. So now that we've done the first part, um, we're going to do a second part, and, uh, and uh, after that, a third part. Now, the reason for us doing this, um, even though this is a polyphonic keyboard, uh, we're doing it monophonically so that we have more control. I, mean, I have more control of the uh, individuality of uh, each part. If I decided to bend a particular note that I didn't decide to bend the first time, it gives it a, its own kind of character. So this is the second of three. And after three, we're going to do another time, which is none. Okay, here we go. Go back again, I got to rest. I rest. I rest it. This is the third and final pass. And if I mess up on this one, I'll kick my own. Ask me no question. Tell you not. I put down the um, the uh, the ARP, which we weren't able to get working um, on the actual uh, presentation today. But that was the next thing that I did. We did um, three different tracks of of the ARP. I did the low part first, then the middle part, and then the high part, which is the the melody that I used. Uh, after um, doing that, uh, Nathan Watts put down his bass part. called in the, the horn players, as we had um, in this demonstration here. Um, the only difference is uh, um, on the session we used the late um, Ray Maldonado, who played trumpet. But um, we are fortunate to, to, um, to have the, uh, the talents of Larry Giddens, who Perform and who actually had played on some of the stuff that we had done later on with Larry Giddens um, on this particular presentation. So we used um, Trevor Lawrence, Hank Red, Steve Medea, and uh, on the record, Ray Maldonado, and uh, on this presentation, Larry Giddens. The way it was mixed, the way the horns were so uh, crisp and they had that presence to it. Um, I mean, these guys, Steve Madeo, Hank Red. Trevor, where are you, Trevor? Trevor, where are you, Trevor? Come on, Trevor. Trevor. Come on, Trevor. 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 Talking about you. Come on over here, Trevor. Talking about the horn section. Talking about, um, I wish the sound of those, that horn section. And uh, these three guys, man, were killing it, man. Ray Maldonado was going now, but he, it was, it was. The wall, it's really nasty yeah. sound. Yeah, it really? was, it was. The wall, the sound. It's great, incredible. Incredible. Hot horn section. The thing with I Wish, which I found out just recently, I didn't get a credit for playing drums. Didn't I play drums on I Wish? Okay, Steve. <laughs> That's messed <laughs> up. <laughs> you did. <laughs> We're sorry. <laughs> Stevie is from, from that old mold. That old mold of, of black people that really believe that anybody can do anything they want to do. Um, he ne I don't think he's ever felt limited in his life. He always felt that he could do anything he wanted. See, because he, because 
he can't see, it gave him an advantage over a lot of people because color really, really didn't mean shit to him because he never saw color anyway. So he had the God-given talent and he had the, the structure around him and the support around him so that he could be himself. And he was a unique character. Even as a kid, you know, he was uh, full of pranks. He was doing all kind of stuff. Never felt sorry for himself because he was blind. You either have that thing or you don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what it is, but it's he's got it. You know, it's, you either have it or you don't. And I think that's the divinity first. It's uh, a person really surrendering to themselves to become uh, a terminal. That's really what it's all about. You know, once you decide you are cause and manifestation, you usually get in trouble because you're taking God's job away. And we always just say that in the studio, leave the space for God to walk through the room. Stevie does. When I worked on Songs in the Key of Life, uh, when I decided even against the many people that felt it was not a smart idea to release a double album, but there were those that felt, you know, yeah, but it's time. They didn't know where it was going to go and what we were going to do. And I can't tell you that I knew exactly what was going to go either and what we was going to do. But I, I went on, on faith. I believed that God would give me the songs, the music, the ideas. And so I went out really on faith in believing that there was a lot um, that needed to be said. And I knew that there was a lot you know, I, I wanted to say. When he got to Songs in the Key of Life, not only his own uh, evolution as a creative artist, but the evolution of what was going on from, let's say, 6970, where Curtis Mayfield begins to do a range of concept albums, and Isaac Hayes is coming with a concept, and then Marvin Gaye drops What's Going On. I think those projects are very pivotal to understanding the point at which Stevie is doing Songs in the Key of Life that he took the concept idea, the idea of the concept album, and at that point laid perhaps the most massive canvas of creativity that had been done at that point. He also had become a master of how to express those social ideas through music and how to, in effect, communicate past the kind of human biases that especially operate in, in the territory and framework of the United States and to actually reach past those and to reach people who otherwise might not want to listen to that kind of message, but through his musical genius would not only listen, but would digest it and understand it. I said to, to Steve, I said, you know, to a lot of people here that are Buddhists and, and they haven't done that, even they practice. And you think we could, you know, had to take uh, like uh, 20 minutes to, to do that? He said, Oh, absolutely. And he said, as a matter of fact, hey, he, he spoke to, to his brother and, and everybody said, let's go chant with them, you know? And he, he made everybody go in and, and chant with us. So we all chanted Nam Yoho Renge Kyo for about maybe 10 minutes. And then, and then we did this book, but of course only, Stevie didn't have the Braille book. And I put everybody, even the non-Buddhists sat there while we did the ceremony, it was just fantastic that they were open enough to do something uh, on the spur of the moment like that, that's, that's spiritual. Because a lot of people are not free enough to do that. For as much as we know and learn is as much as we become liable for what we do or do not do. And when I say we, I mean we. I'm talking about me, you, you know, all of us. We have that responsibility, so I just hope that uh, in the end, uh, as, as I said, God, you know, he knows our hearts. So I hope that he will know my heart and I hope that I will have done uh, enough good to be there in that good place. He's a great terminal. And, and I think uh, the higher power appreciates the person that's willing to, to, to become a huge terminal like that. Because, the cup will be filled up. <laughs> you surrender to that. There are people who have let the problems of today lead them to conclude that for them life is not the way. But every problem has an answer, and if yours you cannot.
not fine You should talk it over to him He'll give you peace of mind When you feel your life's too hard Just go have a talk with God And Stevie was always digging and, and growing right with the technology, so he... Uh, uh, heaven help uh, leaving Stevie in the room with all those decisions and all those choices, you know, because he, he will try every one of them. And I, we all have the same fever. To, well, I wonder what it would sound like with this way and explore it. Now, this sound, as you hear, is um, the, what, the time modulator or something? Yeah, Marshall time, Marshall time modulator. modulator. And this was uh, one of those devices that we were given to experiment with. You know, when people came out with different things, they would always say, well, check this out, wonders. No, they would say, <laughs> they would say you know, um, to John or, or to uh, Bob. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> they, would say, they would say to John or Gary, you know, let's see you know, how it would work, you know, for what you're doing. And so... This is one of those things that we use for um, for black men. Now, come on in with that bass, baby. Now, what do we put on first? Well, we thought that the Rhodes probably was one of the first things to come on. That was our standard modus operandi yeah, right. in those days, was to exactly. start off with a Fender Rhodes on most things. And then go go right to a bass, and then uh, drums. drums. How are you gonna, wait, I think you have to hold, well, I don't know how we're gonna do this, Gary. Okay, uh, okay, go. And the time modulator thing? Time modulator? Yeah, wait, as soon as you do that. Okay, let's do this again. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you hear the drums, the toms, we use the uh, neutron sound, which is like a boom, boom. There's a filter that triggered the uh, toms to, to opening up the filters. Closing the filters up, as you can hear. If you listen very carefully, you'll hear me hit various times <laughs> <laughs> the microphone, the size of the drums. You know, I wasn't looking at the drums too well. Yeah, that was part of the sound. See? That's what made it funky. I remember we worked on this song on the 4th of July in 1976. We did. Do you remember that? I'm almost sure we worked on this. We, had, we worked on, in 75, I think it was 76, we worked on it. So you didn't give us 4th of July off? Didn't get it off, off. didn't <laughs> get it off. Boy, that's no. unusual. <laughs> no Barbecue holidays. was at the studio. Yeah. My Remember Calvin in the barbecue pit? Yeah, he could, he could barbecue. He was a professional. So, and then we had, did we? We did similar things with the, the synthesizer there. Do you remember the horn section, Steve? Yeah, I did like a da da da. Oh, so can um, you sing? That, were you inspired by the 4th of July? Oh, without question. I had a da 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 da. God will give the gift to everybody. 
and we've been fortunate enough to be together as, as, as collective at one time point in life to share music, man. That's the main thing. And Steve yeah, gave us all the opportunity to do that it's together. You know, because I mean, everybody here was from somewhere else. But without, the, without Steve, we would never met. That's right. Well, this is exciting for me because I had been playing on the road with Buddy Miles and them. Okay. And then the guy asked me, did I want to audition for Steve? And I was living in a garage at that time. I had lived in a garage for two years. And then I took my change that I had like $80 and uh, went down and got, a, got my horn out of the pawn shop and went to audition. That's when I got with Wonder Love. And this is coming right in at what point? What year? That was right in the very beginning of coming into 74. Right. Yeah. So, so this is so all three songs. Yeah. Right, I came into the audition of it and then, then met Nate and then Raymond and then, yeah. Well, I remember when we went to New York, I was 75, and we did ask with this cat here. Steve said, Man, I got this drummer in New York, man. He's bad, he's bad, he's bad, he's bad. I said, okay, Steve. Because Raymond was playing on the other stuff. I said, okay, 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 okay. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. Got there. It was me, Michael, and Herbie was there, and Greg. This cat laid such a hell of a thing on the ass. Greg Brown, this boy had a pocket. I couldn't, I know. I was like, whoa, oh, 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 oh. Maybe I stopped playing. I never I was, I, was, I, was, I was telling them on the way here when they pick us up from the airport. Playing with you is like you just I ain't no there's very few bass players I play with that make me sound good. Like I'm a superstar. You just all the information is in your fingers. So just being on that one tune, just having that one association um, makes me feel um, that and I'm so happy I was at the right time, at the right place, you know, to be, just have one little part in, in that uh, project. I think the greatest thing that somebody can give you is that time in their life. And you know, when you're, when you're in it, you really, I mean, you, you're so much in it that you really don't understand, almost you don't appreciate the significance of that time. So I, it was just a very special time, and I think it's, it's hard to describe what it's like to work on something like this. Uh, I just recently started to think about what it meant to work on this, and I, I think what it means is that you actually leave something behind. One of the thousand things I love about Stevie is he knows where the music came from, so that's why he knows where to go and is sure-footed when he goes there. Because that's very important, is to know what, what happened before. And uh, I, I always respect the young dudes. Well, Stevie's uh, not as young as 12, but he's still a young dude. Um, he knew what everybody was doing. You know, he was right into it, you know. He was all aware, and I, I love that, love him for that. But that's, that's just natural with him. I felt... Um that uh, John and Gary should have been nominated and definitely should have received a Grammy for this album because um, they opened up so many different avenues. To me, it's almost like the, 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 uh, the songwriter who um, can play keyboards or play a guitar or whatever and sing his or her melody, you still need that person to take whatever you have and to be able to, or, to arrange it, to make it get from that place that's inside your head that's on the guitar or keyboard that you're playing, to then if you use other musicians to be able to create what you want to be captured on paper so that the other musicians can read it and follow it. That's equally as important in the case of an engineer to the to the artist. If you don't have someone to capture that emotion, to take all that you have that you're expressing and put that on tape, you know, you're lost. See, Stevie had a 
wonderful way of taking his life experiences and putting them to music and, and making them real, raw, and yet very commercial. Now that's very hard to do. <laughs> and he was saying that I was mumbling the words to I wish. I said, no, I'm not mumbling the words, it's just, you know, we haven't decued it yet. And he said, no, you're ridiculous. He says, and I think I said, uh, I told him that I had lots of different people. I said, George Benson. He said, well, George Benson, you're ridiculous. George Benson, you know, he, he sounds better than you. He's, you know, you're ridiculous. It really is a place where you wish those days would come back. You know, you, you have those moments where you want to go back to that period. And I think he captured it for us, and captured it for us in, um, I just think, a very special way. Very special, very special, unique way. I wish, when that came out, that was around the time I first started going to parties. And we would stand on the wall. We would stand with our backs on the wall. And everybody was, you know, we were young, so we'd be kind of scared to dance, especially with the lights on. But when I wish came on, you had to dance. Looking back on when I was a little nappy headed boy. Then my only worry was for Christmas, what would be my toy? one of the best works he's, he's done that, that has come out. <laughs> because we all know that this, no, we know what's in the can. <laughs> you know, and I remember uh, sitting on uh, Vine and Sunset with Steve in the car and actually turning the stations and hearing it on every station. <laughs> all at the same time. Which is, is pretty phenomenal. And just being part of it because uh, I went out on tour with these guys later, but Steve and I were, you know, really good friends for a long time, but I always felt as though these guys were family. And to have a part and to participate in, in this record, which I think is a landmark record in music history, is, is a great experience. You yeah, listen to it 20 years later, it's still just a great record. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And when it, it came out, it's so different than anything that was happening at the time, and it just sort of changed the whole music thing into another dimension. It took it to another place. Right? Forget Stevie, for everybody. I must admit, I was extremely unhappy about $13 million. Of course, until <laughs> Songs in the Key of Life was released, and it came in at number one, 
Then I thought, what a brilliant negotiator you are <laughs> to myself. If you sit down now and you listen to that album all the way through, it takes you through life. I, I would place him uh, right alongside all the greats, uh, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Marvin Gaye. He is um, like an example of, of the best of what a human being can be. As much as I'm sure all of us feel that Songs in the Key of Life was a very high point in our life, it is not the highest point. Um, I just feel that um, as much as we have been blessed and honored with the opportunity of creating music and, and them engineering, uh, it's almost like when they used to ask Duke Ellington what is his most favorite song, or his greatest song, he would say, I haven't written it yet. I just think there's so much more that we will all do. But it is definitely a, a time and a space that we cannot uh, ever forget. Mm -hmm.